Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our program today. Um, we're going to get started. People are still filtering in, but we'll just go ahead and start. Um, my name is Thisbe Gensler. I'm a research associate here at the Getty Research Institute and a contributor to the exhibition we have up now in our galleries, Flesh and Bones, The Art of Anatomy. Um, this is a show that takes advantage of the fabulous collections we have here of anatomy books to showcase the diverse ways that artists have represented human anatomy for the past 500 years. And we hope we'll give you guys a good sense of how profoundly entangled art and science are. Um, so I'm going to let Monique Cornell, the curator of the exhibition, give a full introduction but of our speaker, Lyle, who we're really delighted to have here for the last few weeks of the show. Um, but first I want to give a little bit of housekeeping notes. Uh, please remember to silence your cell phones at this time. Um, also, this event will be recorded, so the uh, video will be available to watch on the Getty Research Institute's YouTube channel in the next few weeks. Can you hear me? Um, I also want to acknowledge Getty's presence on the ancestral, traditional, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Monique Cornell, the exhibition curator. So it is a, a great pleasure to, to introduce Professor Lyle Massey of the University of California, Irvine. Professor Massey is an art historian who specializes in the area of art and science in the early modern per period, in particular on the history of perspective and on anatomical illustration. She is the author of Picturing Space, Displacing Bodies, Anamorphosis in Early Modern Theories of Perspective, published in 2007, and the editor of The Treatise on Perspective, published in 2003 by the National Gallery of Art, Washington. Adding to her interest in the depictions of bodies and of space, she has also embraced the desert, <coughs> and last year, <coughs> the invention of the American desert, art, land, and the politics of environment, which she co-edited, appeared. Professor Massey has given careful consideration to the aims and methods of anatomical illustration and to the perceived authority of the image of deception, <clears throat> particularly of the human body. She has written on Remelin's flop anatomies of the early 17th century <clears throat> and early and English obstetric atlases of the 18th century and wax anatomies of the same period. She organized an exhibition in 2005 at Northwestern University focusing on the anatomy of gender. Her talk today is part of a book project titled Anatomy Queered, Imagining the Body from the Margins of Dissection, that will examine representations of the normative body in anatomical illustration and challenges to it. This afternoon, she will no doubt further give us further food for thought um, with which to re-engage with the exhibition Flesh and Bones, The Art of Anatomy, on now at the Getty Center until July the 10th. Please welcome Professor Massey as she guides us through the polyclitus problem, illusions of the ideal in European anatomical imagery. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks for coming out for this. Um, and if you haven't seen this exhibition yet, um, rush over after this talk to go see it because it's got some fabulous things in it. And in fact, I want to start by thanking um, the Getty for inviting me and Monique um, in particular, who is a friend for inviting me and also for curating this exhibition, which is full of mostly things that come from the Getty's own collections. and. Um, gives you a sense of really what's here. It's an amazing uh, special collections that's here at the GRI. And also Thisbe. Um, Thisbe's been incredibly patient, uh, patient through, you know, postponements and contingencies that have occurred uh, because we were supposed to do this a month ago. Um, and then also was a contributor to the catalog as well. 
and also a, a former student of mine, Aaron Travers, contributed to this catalog as well. So this is an all family, all home kind of affair. Um, and I'm really delighted to be a sort of a peripheral part of it. So I, I wanted to start this by saying, can everybody hear me too? I'm, I'm kind of, yeah, awesome. Uh, to, to say that the, the paper I'm giving today, kind of sort of the, the impulse for it, uh, came from um, me, I, I teach a class in medical humanities at the University of California, Irvine. And one of the sections that I deal with in that is on sort of disability and disability studies um, and talking about um, the, the idea of representing the disabled body. Um, so one of, what, the question that comes out of that with students is often sort of, well, how, who determines what's normal, right? Who determines what the normative body is? Because that's, of course, the question that comes up in disability studies. It's like, well, if you don't actually fit that standard, who are you and what are you and how are you evaluated socially and culturally, um, let alone artistically? So that's kind of the, the, the background that led me to this question about, well, what, what, what is the normative body in the early modern tradition, which is what, what Monique and I both study, where we specialize in the, the 16th and the 17th centuries. What, where did that normative body come from? What did it look like? What were the kind of reasons uh, behind it as it begins to appear in anatomical atlases um, of the period? So if you, if you notice nothing else in the exhibition, you will no doubt mark how it highlights an extraordinary variety in representational approaches to portraying human anatomy over the past 500 years. It covers bodies in various degrees of dissection, viewed from multiple different perspectives, overlaid with references to antique statuary, references to different genders, and even animals such as horses. But in the long history of European anatomy, one constant visual trope threads through the books on display. And that's even, um, a lot of those, the books that are in the exhibition have this, even if those pages are not actually on display in the vitrines in the exhibition. And this trope is a standard figure that's generally male, classically posed, representing a clear visual embodied ideal. Here are just some of the examples. Uh, one, this is uh, Berengario de Carp Carpi's um, uh, beautiful sort of first image. It's one of the, the, it really is pretty much the earliest image of this sort uh, that dates uh, to 1521 uh, in a book that he published was actually a, a kind of instruction manual based on a, 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 a work by an older anatomist named Mondino uh, de Luzzi. So we get that. And then you jump ahead, um, and the date on this is wrong, but I'm not actually gonna go into it, but Monique, who's been editing and editing and editing, pointed this out, but this is actually jumping ahead. It shows this connection from so the early 1500s to um, the you know, mid uh, 1700s, where you have Jan van der Leer's fantastic uh, depictions of the muscled body uh, in a work uh, by um, Siegfried Albavinus. And then here, uh, yet again, this is actually in the exhibition. These are the beautiful um, life-size uh, works after um, waxes in Bologna by Ercola Lelli, and these are by Antonio Catani. So this, this is the, the kind of image that I want you to keep in mind as we, we move through this paper. So, Although the exhibition attests to the diverse anatomical images in early modern printed works, the idealized male figure was, for centuries, taken as a standard for understanding human, human anatomy in general. It is a constant in the history of European medicine, and it appears still in, pl in places like Gray's Anatomy, which many of you, even if you're not doctors or trained medical professionals, you, you know it from the show, the TV show, right? But that Gray's Anatomy was um, kind of the go-to manual for anatomy anatomical education in the 19th, late 19th and the 20th centuries. The fact that an anatomical illustration of a black female pregnant body created by Nigerian medical student Chidi Ibe 
ricocheted through the internet in late 2021, and multiple news organizations carried his plea to have medical illustrations reflect diversity, speaks to the ways in which that standard that we're talking about here still dominates, so much so that contestations of it seem novel even today. So the origins of this standard figure can be traced back undisputedly to 16th century surgeon and anatomist Andreas Vesalius. Vesalius's contributions to anatomy are understood to be a result of his methodological break with the late medieval tradition that relied heavily on the writings of Galen, a second century Christian era Hellenistic physician who worked in the Roman Empire and whose influence was widespread in universities throughout Europe in the Middle Ages and, and well into the Renaissance. Dissection, while actively practiced from the 13th century onward, was frequently used in university settings to demonstrate Galen's assertions. That is, a body was dissected to locate and display Galen's theses as they were being read aloud by a professor of medicine. As most scholars agree, Vesalius challenged both this practice and uncritical rote repetition of Galen by insisting that knowledge of the body could not reasonably be obtained through textual authority alone, but instead required engaged direct observation uh, made through hands-on dissection. So this, this insistence on visual and experiential confirmation, I should have given, Vesalius is basically working in the first half of the 16th century. So this insistence on visual and experiential confirmation is expressed in both the text and the now very famous woodcut engravings in Vesalius's magnum opus, De Humani Corporis Fabrica, first published in 1543 and then in a second edition in 1555. And that, that is on display in uh, the exhibition. So the volume opens with a book devoted to osteology or bones and a series of beautiful prints of skeletons. This is then, is then followed by book two, which is devoted to myology or musculature. Um, and book two is populated by what are undoubtedly the most famous images in the volume, if not in the history of European anatomy as a whole. A male figure is represented, first in a series from the front and then from the back, starting with the superficial muscles and then followed by successive images showing layers of muscle stripped down uh, and all the way to the bone. And here is the first figure in the series, a frontal view of what is called an écorché, in which the body is shown without its skin to reveal the superficial musculature underneath. In addition, we see here a visual and typological conceit that also appears in the skeletal figures. The body is portrayed as though still living, posed standing in a landscape with a hint of motion in hips, legs, arms, and slight twist to the torso. As Sachiko Kusakawa has argued, the Fabrica's images were constructed to provide an authority not furnished by the text alone. The there are over 200 um, images in the Vesalius. Uh, the uh, large and very expensive plates were intended to enhance the beauty and the desirability of the book, but also to mediate between the anim anatomist's observations and the assertions of new knowledge contained in the printed pages. Um, most people sort of recognize this book as the foundation of what will become modern anatomy. It's, it's, it's recognized as a, a kind of game-changing book in that sense. Before the Fabrica, Vesalius had employed schematic printed images as pedagogical supports in the anatomy theater. And these were not simply teaching aids, but templates that he, he gave to his students to show them how to see the things that he was describing in dissection. And that's actually really important to think about the pedagogy of something like anatomical dissection. Uh, he used these, these aids basically to show his students so that they could then transfer what they saw in the prints to what they then saw in the dissected body on the table. So the images were designed to persuade medical students by establishing a correspondence between Vesalius' inter interpretation and what was seen through dissection of the body. And of course, what, that, what this does is it basically places that authority on Vesalius and starts taking it away from Galen, right? From uh, the, uh, the authority that had been invested in the texts um, by Galen. They were also, though, designed to persuade through the adoption of classicizing motifs applied by the Flemish artist Jan Stefan von Kalkar, who most likely produced them following 
behind Vesalius' own strong preference and direction. So there's no doubt that these images are reliant on Greek sources. The first muscle figure resembles one of the most famous Greek works that occupied Renaissance art theorists, the canon by 5th century BCE Greek sculptor Polyclitus. The canon was chiefly known in the 16th century through two sources. One was ancient Roman historian Pliny the Elder's Natural History, which mentions that, quote, Polyclitus made a Dorypheros, a virile-looking boy. He also made a statue which artists called the canon, and from which they derived the basic forms of their art, as if from some kind of law. So this is, there's a bit of ambiguity in that, in that translation. Um, uh, but for many centuries, it's been assumed that the canon was therefore the Dorypheros that he originally mentions. The Dorypheros being a spear bearer um, and a, attributed to Polyclitus, there are a number of copies of it. Um, there's no original Greek bronze or marble, uh, but many, many Roman car copies of the Dorypheros um, that exist. And here's one of them, this is in, in Minnesota. It's a very highly contested uh, one now because the Italian, the Italian government wants it back. While Pliny points to the idea of the canon, he does not elaborate on how it's constituted or what rules it follows. In fact, those principles have largely been preserved through the other primary source of information on the canon in, 16, in the 16th century, and that's from Galen, that same Greek physician and anatomist that Vesalius both reveres but also you know, bases his entire career on critiquing. In his treatise, De Temperamentis, Galen distinguishes between the proper proportions of humoral elements, a balance between hot, cold, dry, and moist, and the proper disposition of body parts. While they may be connected, the former, that is the humoral elements, leads to health, but the latter expresses beauty, which is a very interesting sort of distinction for a physician to make. In describing the body's structure, Galen suggests that knowledge of it requires repetitive experience, and it is, the, it is only in this way that students develop a trained mode of inquiry, allowing them to see and extract the mean or average out of a wide range of variations. Invoking Polyclitus's canon, Galen states that such a mode of inquiry was practiced in art before it was necessarily understood in medicine and anatomy. So I'm, I'm giving you these two quotes. I'm not going to um, read them entirely, but just sort of point out that this is where uh, Galen basically draws on Polyclitus uh, for this sort of paradigm that he's uh, building about um, the mean or the average. And you'll just see in that the top quote um, that, he, that he says, you know, in a, two sentences down, thus do modelers, sculptors, painters, and indeed image makers in general paint or model the most beautiful likenesses in each case, that is the most beautiful man, horse, cow, or lion, by observing the mean in that case. So he's basically comparing what he thinks um, the anatomist should do in terms of evaluating and understanding the human body to what the artist, um, the polyclitus does, um, with, uh, or what the artist basically does. Elsewhere, Galen then stipulates exactly how, well, not exactly, but, you know, has the, the clearest explanation of how the canon itself works in Polyclitus. Um, he says uh, that uh, the ancient philosopher Chrysippus shows us that beauty does not re reside in the proper proportion of the elements, I'm reading the second quote here, but in the proper proportion of the parts, such as, for example, that of finger to finger, and of all of these to hand and wrist, of these to the forearm, of the forearm to the whole arm, and of everything to everything, just as described in the canon of Polyclitus. So most historians and classicists now believe that the canon system of proportions, as understood through Galen, was founded on the measurement of the distal phalange of the little finger, which is the, the smallest, you know, the very end of um, the pinky finger, which served then as a prime unit for a system of ratios throughout the rest of the body. The basic ratio seems to have been 1 to 1.4142, which is um, a, a kind of a very anal sort of uh, uh, way of trying to, you know, 
parse something that actually clearly that probably didn't work quite as mathematically precisely as that. But um, it was built upon Polyclitus's determination of what size and length the perfect distal phalange should be. And I think that's really important to recognize that, um, you know, for Polyclitus, right, he is composing what he considers to be the perfectly balanced and harmonious body. So he is imagining what that distal phalange and what those ratios should look like on the body, right? So in other words, the ideal form determined by the artist was a product of his aesthetic understanding of proportion and mathematics, which he then translated into a sculptural body. So in contrast, right, for Galen, the body itself could be understood as an exemplum of physical and mathematical perfection predetermined in nature. So you can see how that flips, right, with Galen. That uh, in the one sense with Polyclitus, he's interested in basically producing a formula for, for, for constructing a perfect figure. Galen is interested in using Polyclitus's notion to understand what the perfect human body would look like. So Vesalius, Vesalius absorbs Galen's example but he also ends up conflating artistically produced bodies with those found in nature. That's what, I think that's what um, the, the Fabrica does. In book five of the Fabrica, addressing the question of what kind of body is suited to dissection, he says, for public dissection, for public dissection, and there is a distinction uh, in 16th century Italy between the kinds of um, dissections that were performed in university settings uh, to which members of the public would, you know, could be invited, and the many other kinds of dissections that are performed by anatomists in their own homes or in private settings for students. So he says, though, for a public dissection, it is good to have a body provided that is as well compounded as possible for its sex and of middle age, so that you will be able to compare other bodies to it as to a statue of Polyclitus. So Vesalius was not the first to suggest that dissections would be best performed on a body that met some standard for regularity. In 1497, Alessandro Benedetti suggested in his Anatomice that anatomical dissections for students should be performed on median bodies that conform to a standard of sex, male, age, height, and weight. But Vesalius cemented the association of Greek sculpture to standardized human anatomy, in part because the large-scale illustrations in the Fabrica rely so heavily on tropes of athletic male muscularity and canonical proportions. The design and cast of these figures and their association with polyclitus are not merely included, though, to enhance the aesthetic desirability of the volume, although they clearly are, right? I mean, in a sense, he is producing a volume that's go going to be incredibly expensive, and it's meant to appeal to those who are, can actually purchase books of uh, that size and that expense. So it, they are meant to enhance the beauty of the volume. But that's not the only reason. They also form the foundation of Vesalius's claims to produce a normative view of human anatomy. The representations fulfill the task that Vesalius sets himself to improve and perfect the Greek view of human anatomy begun by Galen. The muscle figures that appear in Book Two clearly imitate and are meant to recall associations with the Dorypheros. The first muscle figure shares with the statue a classical contraposto, the counterbalance weight shift to one hip, relatively long and elegant leg and arm lengths, and an overall geometric balance similar to the Dorypheros. Where it differs from the Dorypheros, however, is in the extraordinary articulation of muscles, of which Polyclitus' statue actually has very little. You can see in, in the Minnesota Polyclitus um, Dorypheros that, uh, that it's, it's very schematic, right? There's a kind of, uh, you don't have a great sort of articulation of um, the musculature. You just kind of have these sort of um, allusions to where that musculature might be. Um, this focus on articulated musculature creates the most clear defined bridge between 16th century artistic practices and emerging visual strategies in 16th century anatomical texts. In fact, Vesalius himself indicates how artists preceded anatomists in recognizing the human mean and arrangement of muscles, saying of his first muscle man that it, quote, presents nothing to the eyes that we have not seen learned 
uh, that we have not seen learned artists and sculptors regularly emphasize in muscular, so to speak, square-built men, unquote. So it's this congruence between motion and muscles that provides the most significant connection between art and anatomy. 15th century artists and theorists such as Leon Battista Alberti and Lorenzo Ghiberti, uh, who some of you may have heard of, uh, advocated anatomical understanding as crucial to artistic practice, arguing that artists should know the body from the inside, starting with the skeleton, envisioning the muscles and flesh, and then moving outward to the skin. This was necessary to properly depict the motions of the soul and flesh and to understand how to depict grace and fluidity in figures. Artists such as Michelangelo studied anatomy directly, dissecting bodies to be able to visualize the relationship between action or movement and muscular contraction. In fact, Michelangelo's association with anatomy and dissection would transform artistic theory in the 16th century, making the practice, the practices of dissection, into a staple of academic artistic uh, training. I'll just show this really beautiful uh, uh, pen and ink drawing by uh, Passarotti that actually um, shows us Michelangelo here engaging in a, a, an anatomical, anatomical dissection and demonstration. Um, and there's a number of other sort of artists um, arranged around him from the period like Raphael, uh, who I think is right here. This is Raphael and Andrea del Sarto sitting right here. Um, so this, the idea is that Michelangelo set the standard for a particular investigation into the body that then becomes uh, a part of um, the accepted training for artists. Knowledge of muscul muscularity did not come solely from dissecting human bodies, however. For Michelangelo, Greek sculpture, particularly the expressive forms found in Hellenistic works rather than in earlier classical models like the Dorypheros, were paradigmatic for understanding the relationship between movement and musculature. For Michelangelo, late Greek sculpture meshed nature's perfection with the artist's understanding of form. One might say that the sculpted Greek male body instantiated Michelangelo's conception of human body because it expressed the perfect harmony of form and function. A fragment of Hellenistic sculpture, the so-called Torso Belvedere, was made famous by Michelangelo, for whom it seemed to signal an iconic conflation of aesthetic ideals and anatomical knowledge. For this reason, it also became associated with Michelangelo's own despair. John Paolo Lamazzo, the 16th century theorist, wrote, Michelangelo was never able to add anything to the beauty of the torso of Hercules by Apollonius of Athens, which is located in the Belvedere in Rome, and which he unceasingly pursued. Other stories told about Michelangelo's relationship to the torso and emphasized his awe for it, expressed um, in, in this declaration, which was no doubt apocryphal, that this is the work that attributed to Michelangelo, he says, about the torso, this is the work of a man who knew more than nature. The intimation is that for Michelangelo, the torso represents a Greek mastery and execution of anatomy that he could not himself surpass. But this is also why it may have ended up as a visual reference for visceral figures uh, in book five of Vesalius's Fabrica which you're seeing here. So the torso is on the left, um, a, sort of a fragmented piece of sculpture, uh, the subject of which, uh, you know, what the subject is has been, you know, to, uh, in some dispute uh, for a couple of centuries. Uh, but what we have is a, a sort of articulated muscular um, torso uh, that Michelangelo, uh, the, 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 the legend is that Michelangelo um, particularly admired. Um, but you, one of the things you'll notice is that it's marked by this very strange effect of cleaved marble. Uh, I'm sorry, the, um, so what we have is then the, these figures, these visceral figures uh, in book five of the Fabrica. And you can see that in fact, very clearly they are meant to allude to fragments of classical sculpture. And you see that in these kind of cleaved, you know, these are not, um, these are not what you would see if, in a cadaver, you'd cut off the arms and legs, right? Um, what we have instead is this sort of suggestion that these are marble with some kind of dissection placed on top. So um, 
these torsos then express the Fabrica's kind of contorted relationship to Greek anatomy and especially Galen. They make visible an idea expressed throughout the Fabrica that Greek knowledge represents an ideal that must be broken down in order to reach the truth. Male muscularity was essentially teleological for Michelangelo, but also for Galen before him. And what, what do I mean by that? Well, on, in his treatise on the usefulness of parts, Galen emphasizes that to know a body is, quote, to see how nature shaped each part perfectly for its end. That is to say, its use. And that, that's a kind of Aristotelian notion about um, the, you know, the things in the world being produced basically to serve this ultimate uh, lasting purpose in, and to serve this end. Vesalius, while less inclined to see every part of the body in quite so rigid a manner, nevertheless largely subscribes to this view of nature. The most perfect specimen is also the most natural because nature is inclined to perfection. This is sort of part of that teleological argument. The muscle men represent this idea visually, conflating the living movements of the human body with the dissected musculature of anatomy. Each muscle is shown to serve its end. But the implications go beyond mere mechanics. As Shigehisa Kiriyama has argued, muscle consciousness emerges first in Greek art. I mean, that is, the depiction of muscles emerges first in uh, Greek art. But in medicine, it wasn't until Galen began to systematically identify muscles individually and list their uses that they began to be seen as integral structures to the human fabric. So for instance, in the Hippocratic canon, muscles don't have this, they don't, they don't take on the same kind of character when, you know, in the Hippocratic uh, texts, uh, muscles are referred to as flesh. Um, they, they aren't uh, sort of given this kind of very specific role to play um, in the Hippocratic canon. Uh, the Greeks prized the athlete and the warrior whose articulated and lean forms with visible muscular flexes demonstrated the principle of agon or struggle. The opposite of this was softness encapsulated by fat and formlessness and associated more specifically with femininity. Thus Greek sculpture of the male body evolved into an aesthetic preference for articulated joints and musculature which were in turn taken to define masculine characteristics. Such articulation also correlated muscles with willed movement. As Galen states in On Movement of Muscles, voluntary motion in the various parts of the body is brought about by the contraction of muscles. This distinguishes muscles from, the many, from many other body parts and processes over which humans have no control, such as digestion or the heartbeat. The relationship between muscles and will points to a conception of the human in terms of agency and individuality. Muscles is what makes us human, right? Is because we can actually act according to our will. They make it possible for us to act according to our will. As such, the muscle men appearing near the beginning of Asalius's treatise signal that the fabrica is engaged in defining what it means to distinguish humanness itself. The muscle men are posed as a kind of visual response to the dictum, know thyself, um, which was poached from ancient, the ancient Greek oracle at Delphi and affixed to anatomical treatises and flap sheets in the 16th century, including in a kind of like revised version in um, the fabrica uh, itself by Vesalius. The muscle man is also the foundation of what the fabrica presents as normative. While the term normative is a bit anachronistic when applied to early modern anatomy, it nevertheless designate, designates what is understood as natural and regular in that period. Vesalius acknowledges bodily variations, either visible or invisible, that frequently emerged for him during his own dissections. These variations were often inconsequential to normal functioning. As such, they're, they're what the early 19th century naturalist Geoffrey Saint Hilaire called heterotaxies. That is, they were anatomical ana anomalies that may be deemed abnormal or aberrant, right? That they don't aren't recognizable as part of what should be the standard body, um, you know. But they don't necessarily interfere with normal functioning. So. Uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that might appear in a body, but don't, to make it appear to be different from what the standard expects, uh, but in fact don't actually interfere in any way in the body's normal functioning. So heterotaxies reveal the extent to which the early modern normative body was subsumed by historical and cultural ideas that had little to do with either medicine, health, or even dissection. <clears throat> 
For centuries, the image of the normative body was male, European Caucasian, between the ages of 30 and 40, not too fat, not too thin, muscled and well-proportioned, and in this sort of trick of sort of visual interest, lively and animated in spite of being dead. But most actual bodies in the 16th century, especially cadavers for dissection, failed obviously to fulfill all of the marks on this list. Vesalius accumulates heterotaxic variations and understands them as occurring in both common and rare forms in otherwise healthy bodies. In the same passage where he refers to dissecting a body in public that is similar to one sculpted by Polyclitus, he goes on to suggest that for private dissections, which occur more frequently, it will be useful to dissect any cadaver. So you may consider what kind of body it is too and understand the difference between one body and another and the true nature of many diseases. That is, he encourages students of anatomy to dissect many types of bodies in order to get accustomed to the wide variety they will encounter over their lifetimes. And herein lies the paradox for Vesalius. Identification of anatomical anomalies, pathological deformities, non-standard bodily elements, all those serve as proof that the anatomist, an anatomist such as himself, one who's insisted that you can't just read Galen, you have to actually do this observation yourself, that those elements served as proof that an anatomist such as Vesalius had indeed dissected dozens, perhaps hundreds of bodies, and thus it testifies to his authority which he says is based on his experience. But such experience also comes into direct conflict with the principle of normativity, as diversity in bodies is more the norm than the mean or average is. One can see the effects of this conflict when Vesalius discusses and represents the varying shapes and sutures of the human skull in his chapters on craniology in book one and then the brain in book seven. The images that accompany these discussions make visible the contradictions that Vesalius putatively is trying to avoid. Skull variations in terms of both shape and sutures are represented in this image from the Fabrica depicting five adult human skulls. In one sense, the image is included to demonstrate the sheer variance of human bodies that Vesalius encounters. But the page also reveals Vesalius' attempt to negotiate between principles of regularity and irregularity while critiquing Galen. He declares that the most natural skull shape is the one that's marked prima up here in the left corner. Um, the next three skull shapes represent unnatural variations that Galen lists in On Bones for Beginners. So we have one, two, and three. The fifth skull also comes from Galen, who describes it as a monstrous aberration that would be incapable of life. And at this point, he's talking about the shapes of the skulls. Um, so this is the one that, uh, that Galen would have said was actually incompatible with life. Vesalius, while marking these variations as unnatural, nevertheless states that in his experience and that of his colleagues, variance in skull shape among cadavers is not that uncommon. These three variants aren't perfect specimens of nature, but they are also not the cause of illness or deformation. They are heterotaxic. For the last skull, he discards Galen's identification of it as monstrous and instead correlates it with a pathological condition, hydrocephalus. Thus, Vesalius determines a normative skull shape, but acknowledges variations without associating them either with deformity or disease, except the fifth example. He does not achieve this level of nuance with sutures, however. The first skull has a natural suture pattern. So uh, right here, what, what he calls a natural super, suture pattern, which is the sort of standard. But the other four have sutures that even in Vesalius's time, contemporaries recognized as not just inaccurate, but actually kind of fanciful. Um, so that kind of goes really against what you see with the shapes. The effect is to underscore the idea that only one set of sutures represents nature's perfection. Thus, this illustration and its accompanying text reveal a fundamental conflict in the Fabrica. Vesalius, the anatomist, is committed to observational empiricism, which cannot but help lead him to recognize the extent of variation in skull shape. But Vesalius, the natural philosopher, remains invested in a teleological view of nature, which leads him to insist on the primacy of a normative ideal, even when evidence points in other directions. <laughs> 
the, nor the Fabrica's normative representation of anatomy was admired and often even pirated by his contemporaries and sub subsequent generations of anatomists, but it was by no means instantly dominant as the ascendant accepted form of representation or conceptualization. In the burgeoning arena of printed anatom anatomical atlases emerging in 16th century Europe, there were many competing visions of human anatomy that did not emphasize a normative ideal. One need only compare Vesalius's Fabrica to two other anatomical atlases published within the following 13 years. Charles Estienne's De Dissectione Partium Corporis Humani Libri Tres, published in Paris in 1545, and Juan Valverde de Musco's Historia de la Composición del Cuerpo Humano, published in Rome in 1556, which is actually a kind of redacted version of Vesalius translated into Spanish. Estienne's book is filled with images that defy Vesalian categories. The volume has a sustained series of prints depicting female anatomy, mostly the organs of generation, in poses that are directly taken from erotic prints from Italy, which you actually um, can see here. Uh, this uh, print um, is uh, showing uh, so the, the uterus here, a kind of un unpacked uterus in this figure, and she is lifted uh, specifically from this uh, kind of black market uh, print of um, Jupiter surprising Antiope. Um, this is actually, uh, in, in many of the prints, um, this is uh, smudged out, but it would be an erect penis on the satyr. Um, so that's shocking, right? I mean, there's a kind of shocking element to this, which is that we have an anatomical atlas that's actually using uh, erotic prints as a basis for depicting the female body. Um, not only does this diverge from Vesalius' Greek-centered focus, it pointedly creates analogies between anatomy and penetration, voyeurism, and the uncanny, elements that the Fabrica works very hard to erase or subsume. In addition, the, vol the volume also has a myological series, or muscle series, but in contrast to Vesalius, the muscle men are clearly not polyclitin. Perhaps unintentionally, they evoke the disproportional, the monstrous, the dead and the useless, rather than the ideal or the teleological. While Estienne's volume never had the long-term impact of the Salius's because it remained largely based on older anatomical knowledge, the images resist and question you know, what becomes this kind of Norman, normative polyclitan image. In the other work, Valverde, with the assistance of uh, Gaspar Becerra, a Spanish artist who worked for a time in Rome with um, uh, Giorgio Vasari, who wrote The Lives of the Artist, and Daniela da Volterra, and el in all likelihood actually met Michelangelo through them, and the engraver uh, Nicolas Beatrice, copied the original images from the Fabrica, but also added several really unusual new ones. In one of the added images, Vesalius, uh, Valverde takes Vesalius's brain dissections, puts them on the same page, and then adorns them with different varieties of facial hair. And it's actually quite um, delightful looking at the different kinds of beards um, and sideburns that you see, and the clean shaven here. Um, uh, you know, so it's, uh, it's almost as though what he's sort of saying, that while the brain might be the same in each one of these heads and in each one of these dissections, the bodies themselves aren't. And in fact, Valverde claimed that the wide diversity in human bodies was the reason why so many anatomists spent, quote, their whole life in the study with many human bodies and then therefore were in constant dispute with one another. What makes these images unsettling is that they point to the highly fictionalized nature of the polyclitan normative model and belie the Greek ideal of individuality, agency, and will that fuels the Fabrica's representations. But Vesalius himself clearly saw the conflict, which is perhaps why he took out the reference to Polyclitus in the 1555 uh, revised edition. The Polyclitus problem concerns the way in which a visual and artistic ideal informed the development of anatomy in early modern Europe. Most historians of art and medicine have long recognized that Renaissance artistic study of the human body influenced the development of 16th century anatomy and provided the tools for representing what dissection discovered. They also, though, recognized that pursuit of anatomy through dissection gave 15th and 16th century artists the means for organically understanding how to depict the human figure. 
But the question I've been circling around in this paper is what repercussions or effects followed when anatomists themselves persisted in seeing actual human anatomy through the lens of artistic idealization? When the polyclitin ideal was applied to bodies in all their diversity and variation? The long history of anatomical image making suggests that application of this ideal was neither foreordained nor universal, and it was often subverted visually. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Lyle, for that fascinating talk. We're gonna have time for a Q&A now, so if you have a question in the audience, please come up to the microphones here after Monique um, so that our viewers on Zoom can hear you. And if you were listening on Zoom, please write your question into the Q&A. Thank you. Yes, thanks so much for that. Um, I just had, I had some, I thought I'd quick kick off the Q&A with some comments, questions. So getting towards what Vesalius understood as polyclitin, um, we, we know that Vesalius looked at antique sculpture and he admires at one point in a lecture, he, 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 he admires the depiction of muscles on the back and arm in an antique sculpture, you know, preferring it to what contemporary artists are doing, or else he compares um, the crowns on heads that have been unearthed in Rome to um, the, the cross sections of heart valves. So he's looking, but what did he understand as a sculpture of polyclitus in this period? Because what did anybody understand? And I think, I, as I, I I believe you know it was only the Doriferous was only a, associated with polyclitus maybe in the 19th century. So that's something to think about. And whether you know is he focusing more on the canon rather than you know sculpture? Although there's you know de a definite sense of um, classicism with those figures um, and idealization. And, um, and, and just going towards the idea of looking towards the norm rather than um, variation. You know, as he says in um, he comments, what does he say about, um, in, in giving a public dissection, he says, he's, he, in the fabric, he comments like, don't, if you come across a variation, don't mention it. Yeah, because, you know, it's too confusing, particularly for um, students who haven't dissected a lot, and also, you know, it, they tend to glom on to this one detail. But in the same sense, you know, the, we could look at these images as doing the same thing, presenting bodies without variation. But I wanted you to comment on those uh, um, plates, like the fifth muscle plate, and I think the six, where he inserts animal anatomy. Yeah, well he, you know, he, and he, he tells the reader that he's doing this because he wants to point out the errors of Galen, but at the same time there's this tension because this is supposed to be an ideal body. And he was, I'll let you Sorry, you're absolutely right about the Dorifos, and it's something I probably should have um, I should have said that I mean we're we're not talking about modeling the figures after an actual work of sculpture. We're talking about modeling those figures after an idea of sculpture, um, and so uh, you know what is understood as the canon of polyclitus um, probably gets pretty close um, to you know what the actual Dorifos looks like. Um, but it is, there isn't a kind of one-to-one -one correspondence there. And I think that uh, Monique's exactly right to point that out. Um, but nevertheless, right, there, there's a kind of series of visual cues that, that tell us that, in fact, we are meant to receive these, I think, as sort of classicized figures, nevertheless. Um, the, uh, the, yeah, it's a, that's a great point um, about uh, Vesalius and, and um, because, because basically his probably his primary criticism of Galen is that Galen uh, relied almost, you know, 
exclusively on animal anatomy, um, in part because he wasn't able to dissect. There were prescriptions against it in ancient Alexandria and Pergamum, where he where he was mostly sort of employed as a physician. Uh, so he couldn't. He could not. He was. Um, prevented from dissecting human bodies. So what he did was he used animal anatomy um, to basically sort of draw conclusions about what would be in, in human anatomy. And, and so as you go through the Fabrica, or translations of the Fabrica, because I certainly don't read the Latin, but the, tra the translation of the Fabrica, you realize that he is just repeatedly, there must be thousands of comments that he has in which he actually points out that Galen got this wrong because he actually was relying on pigs or dogs or caudic apes, you know, at, and so he mistook what was he was seeing in human anatomy. So, um, so one of the sort of, I think probably, and I'm sure Monique would agree, that one of the, the, the crucial um, arguments that he's making is that he is revising Galen on the basis of his description of the human body, which comes from his direct dissection of it. And, um, and so he wants to distinguish what is human from what is animal. And that, that is a theme that runs throughout the entire Fabrica. But it does have really interesting visual sort of components to it. Um, uh, there's, there's the very famous image of a skull where the, the lower jaw has been removed and, and, and underneath it instead is actually a canine uh, jaw that is actually being put on. So you have a weird hybrid monster kind of uh, you know, image that combines the elements of both human and dog. And that's all putatively to kind of you know, show us what um, Galen misunderstood. So that uh, that's that's quite, I think another part of this tr of of him using the normative to build up this idea of what's exclusive to the human um, that the, the normative works I would say in correlation with those kinds of comparisons to continue to make the case that this is what the normative human body should look like and, and, and will look like if you actually look, you know, closely enough. Question about the illustrations. Um, did Versalius himself do some of the illustrations for the sexus, the, which I guess is the precursor for the medical the students? Sex, yeah. and, as a, and did he do any uh, the definitive ones in the uh, fabrica? So I don't think anybody has actually identified per se images in the Fabrica that, that, that we know for sure or for certain were actually produced by Vesalius, but there's lots of evidence that he drew quite a bit himself and that he was very um, engaged in the production of the images. And there, there, are, there are art historians who actually have argued that Stephen, uh, Jan Stefan von Kalkar actually did not contribute to the Fabrica, that it, that was all Vesalius, uh, although that's oh. very much a minor <laughs> opinion, um, you know, because he had worked with Jan Stefan von Kalkar uh, on um, those earlier works. So he, and he, and he, actually there's a, um, a, even a line in a letter um, that, uh, where he actually says, I hope to do this volume with the great artist Jan Stefan von Kalkar. So there's a lot of, you know, there's too much evidence that, that, that he, that Kalkar was probably involved with this. But I do, but, um, from everything, I'm sure Money could uh, address this as well, but from everything I've read, uh, you know, there's a lot of really strong evidence that, that Vesalius, he believed in the power of drawing for understanding, uh, encouraged his students to draw as well, um, and uh, was probably very, very closely involved in the design of the images in the Fabrica. The other question would be, you, you, you kind of didn't mention Leonardo because he certainly drew every conceivable, the, the famous story of the old man. He drew him the day before he died, and then he drew him dissected. Mm -hmm. um, so the, there would have been a fairly wide range of, and I think the, the opening plate in uh, Versailles in the Fabrica is a woman's with her yeah. uh, abdomen slit open. Yeah, yeah, actually, the, the, the title page actually shows Versailles dissecting um, a cadaver of a, a female cadaver. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I didn't mention Leonardo, you're right. Um, Leonardo has a really interesting kind of role to play in this argument about musculature. Um, uh, Leonardo is a, probably a, a much more gifted um, anatomist than Michelangelo, for instance, in part because um, Leonardo isn't only interested in superficial musculature, he's interested in the entire body. Uh, I, I'm sure he did more dissections, honestly, than, than Michelangelo did. He didn't do them only and primarily for um, the, the, the things they could give him artistically either, right? Leonardo is the kind of person who's sort of interested in anatomy for its own sake and not just as an aid uh, to his art. Um, but he has, he has some really interesting things to say about musculature. Um, and, and you would say that Michelangelo and Leonardo sort of uh, played off one another in the, his, in the artistic theory of the 16th century over this sort of issue of muscular, muscularity. Uh, muscularity becomes a kind of hallmark of maniera, the, of mannerism, of the artists that kind of follow uh, behind Michelangelo um, and uh, begin to really emphasize the body and the nude in, in various ways in their, um, their, their works. Um, and one of the things that you see in mannerism is a kind of, you know, what Leonardo would have called an overemphasis on muscularity. It's the kind of thing that you see uh, in, you know, uh, certain kinds of paintings, um, like Agnolo Bronzino, or some uh, that come, uh, you know, in the period after Michelangelo's death, um, or bef you know, around the when he's an old man. Those, uh, and they're associated with Michelangelo's work as well. <laughs> yeah, Leonardo has these really funny things to say about that. Like he's, he, he warns about the fact that basically people who do this, who actually sort of paint images of muscularity always run this risk of basically producing, I think it's a bag of nuts, right? I mean, isn't that the phrase, right? So he's, so Leonardo says, you know, that that's an, ex, an excess. And in, in that excess, it doesn't actually achieve um, a sort of proper understanding of the body or a proper artistic representation of the body because it's focused so much on musculature that you wouldn't normally see unless you were looking at an egg crochet, at a, at a, a a figure that had been stripped of its skin. So, so Leonardo, that's a kind of an interesting, I mean, there's a, sort of an interesting, I think, dialectic here about musculature between these two artists who are also the two artists who are most, you know, closely associated with moving between anatomy and, and art uh, in the early 16th century. So, anyway. <laughs> yeah. right, good afternoon. First of all, I want to say thank you for a beautiful lecture. You know, you were able to depict, you know, the evolution of the human anatomy in art through time. So that was very um, eye-opening. Um, the question that I have is this. I mean, as somebody who has um, a background in history, I know for a fact that when new information and technology is born, it is usually taken to the next level by successive civilizations. So, for example, if we look at the United States, everything that, or most of what we have today came from Western Europe. The Western Europeans got their information from the Roman Empire. The Romans got the information from the Greeks, right? And this goes politically, economically, sociocultural, everything, right? But usually, Greece is where everything starts. And it doesn't make sense to me because the Greeks got all of their information from Egypt, ancient Egypt. And the same holds true with anatomy. If you look at anatomy, there is more than enough proof that the first people to depict the human body, at least proportionately, were the ancient Egyptians. And most of it was done in profile, but they got the proportions right. So do you agree with me that, you know, a big part of this lecture, or a small part of this lecture has been left out? <laughs> I, I think that's absolutely fair. <laughs> I, I, um, it's fair to say that. I, I will say that the story that I'm telling is really about 16th century European, early modern uh, anatomy. And for 16th century Europeans in France and Italy and Germany and the, the, 
in the areas where anatomy was taking off as a, this kind of newly exciting sort of science, a uh, newly emerging set of skills, that um, they marked their origins to the Greek texts that had basically survived uh, through the Middle Ages. So um, it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's the debt that they imagined they had uh, to the Hippocratic canon, canon to um, Galenism, to Aristotle. That's, that's what fuels um, their reckoning with the, the human body. Um, so, so, so that's a story that is un, in itself something that's, that's a discourse that's, that, that itself actually is separate from the issue of whether or not the Greeks actually didn't learn something themselves from Egypt, which certainly, you know, there's plenty, I'm, I'm sure, evidence of, you know, cross, cross hybridization, uh, cultural hybridization that could actually make a really interesting story about the origins of Greek um, understandings of anatomy. And, and, you know, I mean, basically even Galen, I mean, um, well, I think it, p part of the problem here is, is that that's the emerging story about the normative body, that is already framed in such a way that it excludes a whole other, you know, excludes so many other kinds of bodies as well as histories, right? And and that that's that is actually, I hope that this came across. That's what I'm critiquing. <laughs> I would like to critique that. I'd like to get in there and actually start to unpack that and figure out, you know, how the, why that had became such a powerful model that it did, um, and it did so in spite uh, the argument I want to make. It did so in spite of the fact that I think there were lots of competing narratives. Uh, that would have pushed that pushed back against that in certain ways, but they're not the ones that historically maybe survived or or were taken up um, by later generations. But I, mean, I think that's a perfectly valid point. I will I'll say that uh, Shigehusa uh, Kiriyama, who wrote this really beautiful book, um, the book that uh, that I quoted from or I, I, I mentioned in my paper is actually this incredible comparison between Western. Western medicine and Chinese, the traditions of Chinese medicine, and one of the things that he points out in that is that um, the that what's what's unique to the Western tradition is this insane focus on the muscular body, right, and on anatomy. He says like in the Chinese tradition, there isn't actually you don't have that. That isn't actually a foundational part of this very venerable, very, very old medical tradition uh, where the body is not seen in those terms, right? The body is instead sort of recognized as a vessel through which um, <clears throat> qi moves and, and different, and you know, the pulse actually is much more important in Chinese medicine. The body is more like a vessel. It's sort of conceived of as a vessel. So. So one of the points that he makes is like you have these two incredibly old um, historical traditions that have extraordinarily different conceptions of the body in the long run. And I think that's, that's really instructive, right? The stories that I'm telling or that we're telling, that the exhibition is telling, are very, very specific in time and place. Um, and they really refer to a particular period of time, you know, um, uh, in which, Western Europeans are actually even defining themselves against colonial, uh, you know, the 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 colonial the people they're meeting in colonialism. They're sort of forming this kind of perception of what the proper European is supposed to be, and they're doing it to exclude as much as possible anything that doesn't fit within that normative category. So, I, I know that didn't really answer your question, but I appreciate very much the the comment. <clears throat> Okay, we have time for just one more question, and I'm going to kind of conflate a few that have come in on Zoom, which you touched on a little bit, which all have to do with kind of the distinction between anatomy and healthcare, and what the implications would be for uh, doctors or studying phys physicians who were looking at these images and how that would um, affect their practice in medicine. Um. <laughs> That's that's an interesting question. I, I should always preface these by saying I'm an art historian. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that's a that's an interesting problem, actually. Because I mean, especially because 
the anatomy texts of this period are not the same thing as the kind of medical texts of these period, which actually, um, you know, pharmaceuticals and uh, surgery manuals and uh, things that are really literally about treatment as opposed to about the conceptualization of the body and sort of understanding human anatomy. Um, so, so the anatomical texts, I, I, I mean, I would like to say, right, that, um, that one thing that I would hope that medical practitioners would take away from this is that in this long history, and certainly this is what I try to get my students to see, in this long history of anatomical inquiry, um, what we want to be attuned to are the ways in which certain kinds of biases and bigotries basically get locked into our understanding of what the human body is. Um, and that, that that would be my hope. You know, I, I don't think, I mean, they're fascinating other things. It's like, I was thinking about all the anomalies that Vesalius recognizes, and one of them is this tiny, tiny little bone in the hand that is occurs in like, very few humans, but actually has the title Os Vesalian uh, Carpi. I think that's what the name of the bone is. Um, and, you know, it's totally useless. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. It's like a vestigial tail or something like that, right? But it actually shows up, right? Um, I, I think, you know, that kind of like extraordinary attention to the body, that's one thing that Vesalius, I mean, Vesalius is amazing in that sense. He, the, the cataloging of every single thing that he saw, um, sometimes not successfully, right? Like the skulls, are really, the sutures on the skulls is a really good example of him kind of getting lazy or something, because um, you know he had to have understood that those sutures were wrong. Um, but, uh, but the other, th other side of this is like this scrutiny, this incredible attention to detail, this like no stone un you know, unturned and stuff like that with um, Vesalius. And I mean, was, that, was he 28 when he published the Fabrica? He was, 20 flippin' eight when he published this. <laughs> um, you know, th this is a testament to the, the, the keen interest and curiosity um, that drove him to, to do this. So th that's not really like I'm asking all, you know, medical professionals to engage in that, but those who teach, certainly, I mean, you know, throw that in your student's face. He was 28 <laughs> when he did this. I feel terrible. It does, God. right? I know. <laughs> well, thank you, Lyle, so much for this fabulous talk. That was really enlightening. And I hope everyone in the audience gets a chance with all this new information to go back over to the galleries and take another look at the show before it closes. Um, thank you again all for coming. And please come back for our future events at the GRI. Have a lovely day. Thank you.